Chapter 3, Section 3. This is how elements combine to form molecules. Our learning objective today is to explain how elements combine to form molecules and compounds. There are two different types of bonds that are very important for this, ionic bonds and covalent bonds, and they're both considered to be strong. We're also going to talk about hydrogen bonds as well, which are a little bit different than both ionic and covalent bonds because hydrogen bonds really don't form an, a molecule or a compound. So, how do they do it? Okay, well don't forget we have something like hydrogen gas, which is H2, plus some oxygen, which is also a gas, and that this comes together to form water. So, one of the important things about forming molecules is they have emergent properties. Liquid water is very different from either oxygen or hydrogen. So, as we combine elements together, molecules have different properties that are different from the individual elements that make them up. The question becomes, how do elements combine to form molecules or a compound? Well, it's about the electrons. Now, don't forget that the electrons are negatively charged particles, and they are found outside the nucleus in what's called a shell. So on your right, I've got four of the most abundant elements found in living organisms, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Whenever we talk about the atomic structure, what we mean is you've got protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and then outside the nucleus in those shells are the electrons. So hydrogen has one electron shell. That's the one with the H at the top left. And you can see the electron shell right there. This is where you're going to find the electron. And carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen each have two electron shells, an outer and an inner. Now elements, what they do is they combine to complete their outer electron shell. So they like to have eight electrons in what's called their valence shell. And the valence shell of any element will always be the outermost ring of electrons, or the outermost shell. And there it is. Hydrogen, of course, the valence shell is, they only have one. And on carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, it would be their second shell. What's important with these valence shells is they have valence electrons, and they are in the outer shell. So if you ever hear the term valence electrons, always think of the electrons that are in the outer shell. And they are the ones most responsible for forming bonds. Electrons like to come in pairs. What that means is if you have paired electrons, then they're not going to be really involved with chemical bonding. However, Whenever you don't have them in pairs, especially the valence electrons, then they like to share or give up electrons to form chemical bonds to put the elements together to form a molecule. And the carbon right there, you can see that the inner shell has two electrons. So those two electrons are not going to be really involved by, with forming any types of molecules. Neither are those two electrons in oxygen. However, you might notice that oxygen does have at least two unpaired electrons. Now, unpaired valence electrons are really important for making bonds. So when you look at these four elements, you notice that there are unpaired valence electrons. There's one for hydrogen, and there's some for carbon. And if you notice, nitrogen has three unpaired electrons, oxygen has two, meaning hydrogen will form one chemical bond, carbon four, nitrogen three, and oxygen two. Electrons are almost always most stable when they're found in pairs. And that goes for the valence electrons as well. So whenever you see a pair of valence electrons, those will not be involved with chemical bonding. Not always, especially for these four elements right here. However, when you look at the inner shell, you notice that there are only two electrons in the inner shell for both carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Hydrogen also needs two in its inner shell. So it's got a one lone electron out there that wants to form a chemical bond. Now oxygen, these electrons right here in that outer shell are also paired, so they would not be involved with chemical bonding. It turns out that in your electron shells, the innermost shell, shell number one, always holds two electrons. So hydrogen only has one electron shell, so it can form one chemical bond. Carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, that shell is filled. However, the outer shell in carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, or the valence shell, wants to hold eight electrons. So it will do and form a chemical bond to either grab or share electrons until it fills up its outer shell. Elements combine to form both compounds and molecules, and they do this to pair up all their electrons in their valence shell. 
Now, a compound is like a molecule in many ways. It's a pure substance made of two or more elements in a fixed ratio. Sodium chloride is an example of a compound. It's table salt. Basically, no matter how much table salt I have, 50% of it will be sodium and 50% of it will be chlorine. A molecule is made of two or more elements joined by a chemical bonds. Here is an example of two very simple molecules, methane and water. So methane is made up of CH4 and water's H2O. So the chemical formula for methane would be CH4. Now a chemical formula tells me how many elements I have in here. So in methane, I've got carbon and hydrogen, and it also tells me the ratio. So I've got one carbon and four hydrogens in methane. Water would have two hydrogens and one oxygen, and that's, like I said, the chemical formula. Elements combine to form molecules. So they make chemical bonds, and they're doing this to complete the valence shell. So we're looking at water, and water is one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen, and they're held together by what's called a covalent bond. And as you can see by this diagram, they're sharing electrons. And when they do that, they become chemically stable. So oxygen needs eight electrons total to be chemically stable. It only needs two more to complete its octet set. Hydrogen only has one electron. It needs one more. So by sharing their unpaired electrons, they form that covalent bond. And these bonds are fairly strong. And when they do that, they have formed water. And there's an example of our covalent bond right there. And it's the valence electrons that are being formed in these covalent bonds. Covalent bonds share electrons. It is the only type of bond that we're going to discuss that shares electrons. However, they are not the same. They can be polar or nonpolar. So two examples are methane and water. Methane has nonpolar covalent bonds and is what we say hydrophobic, meaning it doesn't like to be around water. And water forms polar covalent bonds. And anything that forms lots of polar covalent bonds, we would call it hydrophilic, meaning water loving, or it can dissolve in water. To understand how you get a polar versus nonpolar covalent bond, what's happening here is when you're sharing the electrons, you may not share them equally. So there's a property of elements called electronegativity, and it's determined by the number of protons in the nucleus and the distance to the electrons. Here's how it works. Protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. Opposite charges attract. Here's the four most abundant elements in life, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. The bottom number is the atomic number. Hydrogen's one, carbon six, nitrogen seven, oxygen eight. Those arrows represent who is the most electronegative. So carbon and hydrogen have approximately the same electronegativity, meaning they have the same attraction toward electrons, and they're going to share electrons equally when they form a covalent bond. Nitrogen has seven protons compared to carbon's six. Therefore, nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon, so it would form a polar covalent bond Oxygen is more electronegative than either hydrogen, carbon, or nitrogen because it has eight positively charged protons attracting electrons to it. So here's how they work. Here's oxygen. This is a polar covalent bond. And the oxygen, the reason why it's a polar molecule is also because it's got a negative end and a positive end. Because oxygen is way more electronegative the electrons spend more time near the oxygen. And remember, if you're spending more time near the oxygen and you're negatively charged, you're gonna make that end of the molecule negatively charged. And because I pulled the electrons away from the protons, or the hydrogen, the same thing, that has become positively charged. So these polar covalent bonds, it's an unequal sharing of the electrons because one element has a stronger pull on them than another. Let's look at nonpolar covalent bonds, carbon and hydrogen. Carbon and hydrogen have roughly the similar pull toward electrons, so they share the electrons equally. As a result, this molecule doesn't have a plus or a minus end. And as because of that, 
you can't really dissolve it in water. Elements combine to form molecules. This is an example of a molecule with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, how do you know I know there's carbon in there? What you're looking at is a chemical shorthand for writing molecules out so we don't have to write down all the elements. Let me explain. That line right there represents a covalent bond. So all the lines represent covalent bonds. If there's two lines side by side, that would be a double covalent bond, just sharing two pairs of electrons. When we look at these squiggly lines there, and you see that there's a line, we know that that's a covalent bond. But what is that point? That's carbon. So wherever there's a point, there's a carbon. And the other thing is we don't show all the hydrogens. So each one of those carbons, they can form up to four covalent bonds. They would have two hydrogens attached to them. Now I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself here, but I kind of wanted to give you a sneak preek on that. So nonpolar covalent bonds and covalent bonds, they both share electrons. However, polar covalent bonds share them unequally and nonpolar covalent bonds share them equally. And that actually really matters more than just making a polar molecule. For example, natural gas like methane, which is CH4, stores a lot of potential energy. And the reason why is nonpolar covalent bonds between carbon and hydrogen are easy to break because they store lots of energy. So all of your natural gas is all these nonpolar molecules. Water, on the other hand, does not store as much energy because the electrons are being held onto by the oxygen. Here's an example of how you can tell that one stores energy and one doesn't. You take a match and you can easily light gasoline or any natural gas on fire. You take that same match, throw it in the water, and it goes out. And the reason why is to break any bond, it always requires an input of energy. So it's easy to break the bonds of a nonpolar covalent bond, but it requires more energy to break a polar covalent bond like water. That's why when you throw a match in water, it just goes out. The match doesn't have the energy to break the water molecules, whereas it does have the energy to break the nonpolar covalent bonds of natural gas. Ionic bonds are a second type of strong bonds. Unlike covalent bonds, they don't share electrons. Instead, electrons are transferred from one element to another. We've got an example right here, sodium and chlorine. And if you look closely, you notice sodium only has one electron in this valence shell. Now to add seven electrons to that would be almost impossible. However, chlorine has seven electrons in its valence shell. And you realize sodium, element number 11, chlorine, element number 17. Chlorine's got 17 protons to sodium's 11. Chlorine is way more electronegative. So this is what happens. Basically, Sodium loses an electron and becomes positively charged. But that's okay. By giving up its one lone electron, its second shell now becomes its valence shell and it is full of electrons. It's got eight. It's not gonna form any type of, type of covalent bond. However, sodium is element number 11, but it only has 10 electrons. So it's a positive charge. Now chlorine, way more electronegative than sodium. It's got 17 protons to sodium's 11. Sodium gains that electron. Now its third shell is complete. There are eight. But chlorine now has 18 electrons and it only has 17 protons, so it becomes a negative charge. As a result, you now have two charged ions. The sodium is a cation and the chlorine is an anion. And opposite charges attract each other. And that's how you form table salt. And these ionic bonds, they form compounds, like table salt is a good example. And they're just charged particles. So no matter how much table salt you have, 50% of it is sodium and 50% of it is chlorine. Now I know that I said that ionic bonds are really strong. I mean, you can't really throw salt in your frying pan, heat it up and try to melt the salt. You'll destroy your frying pan long before you melt salt. That's how strong those bonds are. However, when you put them in water, they dissolve because the ions can interact with water. Let's talk about that. Hydrogen bonds are a third type of bond. Unlike covalent bonds and ionic bonds, these are weak and they don't combine elements into molecules. But they are caused by the electrostatic attraction between polar molecules like water. And I want to be very clear, 
when you look at those little dots right there, that's a hydrogen bond. And hydrogen bonds do not share electrons at all. Now the reason why these water molecules are being attracted to each other has to do with the fact that water is a polar molecule. Oxygen is way more electronegative than hydrogen. So it pulls all the electrons to it. And then oxygen has a negative in there. And then the hydrogens have the electrons pulled away from them. So it's got a positive in. Opposite charges attract each other. So because water is a polar molecule, these opposite ends attract each other. But you can tell that hydrogen bonds are weak. You can put your hand in water and run it through it fairly easily. When you do so, you're breaking hydrogen bonds trillions upon trillions at a time, but they come right back to each other. Elements combine to form molecules. Whenever we talk about a chemical reaction, we're talking about making and breaking these bonds. So we're going to break covalent bonds and form new ones. Fire is an example of a chemical reaction where bonds are broken and new ones are being formed. And one thing that's important, elements are not altered in chemical reactions. When you look at this chemical formula, you see C6H12O6 plus O2. If you notice on the left side, they're all on the right side. Cellular respiration, the overall equation is glucose plus oxygen yields some water and carbon dioxide. So we're breaking bonds and forming new ones. On the left side are the reactants and on the right side are the products. And don't forget, if I have 12 hydrogens on one side, 18 oxygens on one side, and 6 carbons on one side, I have to have the same amount of elements on the other side. Like I said, no chemical reaction can ever change an element. In addition to having the same number of elements on each side, the amount of energy on each side also will be equal as well. Cellular respiration is a very important chemical reaction, so is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and water plus energy from sunlight and makes uh, glucose out of that, and it releases oxygen to the atmosphere. And you're looking at LED leaves, you're looking at the small cells, and inside those small cells you can see tiny little green blobs. Those are the chloroplasts, and that is where photosynthesis actually takes place. Now like the force, there must be balance. What that means is, and I've already said this, these two reactions, the top one's photosynthesis, the bottom one is cellular respiration. In any chemical reaction, I must have the same amount of elements and the same elements as the reactants are the same elements as the products. However, I get different molecules. So I break glucose and oxygen down into water and carbon dioxide but I still have the same number of elements on each side. 